Welcome to the Focus on Why podcast. I'm Amy Rowlandson and I ask my guests one simple question, why? Focusing on the importance of why, I share with you the relatable, uplifting and inspiring conversations I have with people from all walks of life. This podcast will encourage you to focus on your why to enable and empower you to achieve the success you desire. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. Before we get started, are you thinking of creating a podcast or are you a podcast host already? As a podcast strategist, I can help you to launch or relaunch a purposeful and profitable podcast, which will inspire, entertain and educate a global audience. Simply book in a one-to-one call with me right now via the Calendly link in the show notes and together we'll focus on the purpose of your podcast. 25th of March 1945. This record has dragged its weary course across Europe and the greater German Reich through the gates of the prison and into the cell itself to a house in a corner there, the very centre and soul of prison life. Any account of this life will be interesting for as much as it treats not of the prison, but the mind and the spirit held there. The journalist would call it the human interest. How did it feel when such and such happened? Did you see a great deal of German such and such? And did such and such frighten or appall or benumb you? There has already been much discussion of this and that and such and such. Without it, we should be at a loss to understand old so-and-so. Poor old so-and-so, his friends in England called him. You will notice this insistence, by the way, that his English friends should, above all things, understand the prisoner. And consequently, since I have been a prisoner myself, my insistence too, almost despite myself, that we should be understood. As a fair-minded reporter, I cannot but reflect the foibles I comment on. All this, by the way. As I was saying, there are yet two factors to be reckoned with. They, more than anything else, determine the course of our life. Before we can settle down to our study of poor old so-and-so, we must just touch on these two. What were these two things he speaks of? Who is speaking here? Both these questions will be answered in due course. Hello and welcome to episode 350. Wow, that has come round so fast. And today is a very special personal episode to mark this milestone. Let's dive straight in and all will become very clear. After my grandmother Ruth died last year, my mother and I were going through her various treasures. She hadn't kept much from her 90 years of life. A few shelves worth of books, a collection of photographs, her own beautiful artwork framed and unframed, some jewellery precious to her, a few bundles of different coloured wool ready to make the next jumper upon request from a friend or family member, and a small battered cardboard box with George written on the side. In the box, I found a book which had been hidden away for decades. In fact, neither my mother nor I recall ever having seen it before. It was in pristine condition and was a book handwritten by George. Finding it and flicking through the pages, if you'd seen my face, you would have thought I'd just found the most valuable treasure to ever be found. And that's because for me, it was. So what was this book? It was a commonplace scrapbook that belonged to my grandfather, George Fleming Kerr, dated September 1939 to 15th of April 1945. In it, the words I opened this episode with, a scrapbook which he had kept as a soldier in the Second World War. On the cover, it reads commonplace scrapbook and on the inside cover is written being notes, reminiscences, impressions, criticism, commentary and work in progress or unfinished. As I flicked through the pages, it fell open to page 40 and there in his entry on September the 30th, 1942 was this. Proposal to write Way of Life, to meet the need for a planned life, to meet every circumstance of life, every facet of living. I was taken aback. This is what I talk about now. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why. I flicked to another page and I stopped at page 55 to find the word why flashing like a lighthouse beacon out at me. It was embedded in an extract from an essay that he'd written called In Quest of a Sense of Balance in 1943, where George discusses how he would tell the story of the world to people who are strangers to it. How curious to read these words, given that I've been writing about the same content these recent years in my Reflections with Actions episodes. 
As with my grandmother, Ruth, I also called George by his first name and we had a very special bond together. My earliest memories in life were those spent together with Ruth and George, each teaching me different things about life. From a very young age, George taught me to inquire further, to not take things at surface level, that there was always more than that which meets the eye on first impression. George and I would read books together, discuss them, go to Shakespeare plays and critique them, sit in the garden, listen to the bird song, and discuss life. George taught me to ask questions and he never once failed to meet my curiosity and never-ending thirst for knowledge. The question why often falling from my lips. Both Ruth and George were heavily invested in my education. However, George taught me more than anyone how to appreciate and recognise beauty in art and literature and also how to love numbers in equal measure. He taught me how to solve verbal and non-verbal reasoning puzzles. Together we would spend hours cracking logic problems with the aim to think and act faster. Essentially, the earliest forms of my reflections with actions. George was an early adopter of technology and bought a word processor for himself and also one for me in 1986 when I passed my 11 plus. A brand new Amstrad PCW8256 and I loved it. I wrote my A-level essays on it and it followed me to university where I used it to write my linguistics degree dissertation on it. I lived with my grandparents for a couple of years as a teenager. George even attended my parents' evenings and would come back with wonderful tailored reflections with actions as to how I could improve in various subjects. I'd only just finished university when George passed away on October the 29th, 1996. George and I had so much in common and I cannot help but wonder just how far his influences on me growing up have shaped my future in more ways than I will ever fathom. There are not many days that go past that I don't think about George or speak to him either in my mind or out loud, especially when I'm reflecting on life or out walking. I only have to spy a robin or see a rainbow to prompt me to think of him straight away. I never realised until this moment quite how profound the times I spent with George growing up have been on me and how they've impacted and guided my life course. Our conversations together today would have been so different. George always had time to be with me. That was his greatest gift, the gift of time. How valuable that was to me. I simply wish that he was alive now so as I venture as a midlife beginner we could talk about the meaning of life and the importance of values and the strength of purpose. I'm certain that George would have absolutely loved this medium of podcasting. To have the ability to record and publish content from the comfort of your own home without the need of having to go through and win over the rights to publication through the large broadcasting companies would have been considered simply marvellous to George. My book on purpose is being written in George's honour and in replacement of the discussions that I wish we could have had together in a physical manner. In the writing of this book, I pay the ultimate tribute to George and the journey that he unexpectedly, or perhaps it was purposely, set me on. What a wonderful guest he would have made on my podcast, except it was not to be. Or was it? 33 years ago, I had the incredible foresight to make a short 17-minute recording asking my grandfather some of the questions that I would want and need the answers to in order for me to write a book about him later in life. In April this year, in fact, on his birthday, I found this recording of me, aged 15, interviewing him about his experiences as a prisoner of war. It would appear that I have been a podcaster far longer than I realised. I cannot describe to you what it was like to hear my grandfather's voice again after all these years and to hear my grandmother too. I believe that this is the universe truly conspiring to help me to put together this book on the topic of purpose. I would love to share with you a couple of excerpts from the interview. As you can imagine, being from a small dictaphone tape recording over 30 years ago, the quality is not great. I was not intending at the time to use it as content in my podcast 33 years later in the future. So please bear with the quality and simply picture a 15-year-old me speaking with my 72-year-old grandfather. We're sitting in his lounge in stratford avon and my grandmother is listening in whilst chopping vegetables for our dinner. You were a prisoner of war for five years in, in Germany? Yes. Yes. And how has that affected you and your attitudes towards Germans? I came out feeling pretty tolerant, really, because I think a prisoner of war is a fairly balanced 
character. How old were you? About 20. So you're very young. Yeah. Um, weren't quite sure what was going on. No, not at all. At 20, do you know anything? No, not a lot. A lot. Did you play it by ear? Okay, going back to your prison days. Yes. How were you treated? Were you treated badly or well, what happened? Well, we, we never knew what was going to happen because the Germans were a mad lot. Yes. And they tended to take hostages. They tended to do sudden purges and shoot people. They tended to parade you at three in the morning and you wondered why. Then they marched you off to another place altogether, a barn, and put you in it. You didn't know you were going to be shot there. In fact, it was retaliation for something he allegedly had done to German prisoners in the Jersey and Channel Islands. Put them in chains. Yeah. Uh, cufflinks, hand, hand cuff, not cufflinks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you never knew which way they were going to bite, jump. And uh, that was for five years. So you get a bit tense, really. You didn't know how long it was going to last, but you you had written home to your family saying, I'll see you in Canada if necessary. Don't wait for me in, in the Great Britain if we are invaded. Um, I also reassured my family. I said, don't worry, I shan't try to escape. So I, that meant that I would get back alive at least, uh -huh. but join them uh, elsewhere if they felt that... to spend just one day with George again now. The questions I would ask him, the experiences I would share. There are so many things that have happened in my life since George died in 1996. I would have loved him to have met and spent time with my two wonderful and now adult children. I would have loved him to come on this show. I would have loved to share the process of writing my first book with him, to ask him more about his thoughts on purpose and of his time in the prisoner of war camps. Sadly, though, it is not the case. I was too young when our paths crossed. That is what is. Instead, 
I would have to share all the precious experiences with him in my heart instead. Yet when I found the book and the tape, I realised that I could have some of the conversations with George after all, just not how I expected to have had them. Here in his journal are his thoughts and answers to many deep and meaningful questions articulated so beautifully in his commonplace scrapbook. This treasure is so much more than a collection of his being notes and reminiscences. It is the very essence of my grandfather sharing his most inner thoughts and reflections of life as he believed them to be in his early 20s. Personal to him, yet also of great relevance to me and to you in today's world. Let me explain why. Not only did George document moments from the months leading up to and living as a prisoner of war, he shared profound observations, reflections, musings, dreams, truths, doubts and fears. I also found another book containing some short stories he'd written whilst in captivity, many photographs that had been taken in the camps and correspondence that he'd sent and received through his five years of captivity. Together, they form a beautiful collection of moments, which as a contribution I believe needs to be shared with you as it attempts to explain the meaning of life. George's scrapbook illustrates the experiences of his time training to be a soldier, of heading into war, travelling towards the front, trying to evade being caught, being caught, and then being marched across France into Germany to be held captive. George then spent five years in captivity living each day from moment to moment as though it could be his last, not ever knowing for certain, yet despite this he continued to chronicle snapshots of his daily life right up until his release. The scrapbook starts and ends worlds apart, from his hometown of Southport, England, to the prisoner of war camps in Bavaria, Germany. Having signed up in conscription, George shares the doubts he felt heading off to fight in a war he didn't want to be a part of, to then be held captive in a prisoner of war camp that he did not want to be in, to live a life that was not what he expected during his early 20s. George reflects on so many moments of his life during these six years. He reflects on the lives of his brothers, also displaced by the war in other parts of the world. Whilst held in captivity, drawing inspiration, hope and meaning from literature, nature and music, George read and recalled essays, poems and plays spanning millennia from Plato to Keats, Marcus Aurelius to Gerald Manley Hopkins, Catherine Mansfield to Shakespeare. Allow me to share with you a few excerpts to give you a taste of what he wrote. He opens in September 1939, Southport. I sit in my stuffy little office and listen to John's portable. Once again, the announcer tells of the towns bombed by the Nazi Air Force. Warsaw, Chestakova, Krakow, Wuch, Lwów. Krakow hurts most. I don't know why. Perhaps because of its city square or its university, or because of the cathedral which for centuries has watched the coronations and burials of the Polish kings. This morning, German planes again flew over western Poland and bombed Warsaw. Chestakova, Lwów, Wuch, Krakow. December 1939, Aldershot. I am lost in this place. The long physical day puts me into a deep sleep each night. But all this cheerfully bad singing, the hurry and jostle in the canteen, the mass activity, whether at drill or on the square, in the bath huts at lunch or at night in the town, all this cannot be my world forever. Or if it's so to be, then I want someone else to be in it with me. I feel now that I need never have joined up, that life in England is everywhere else quite normal and that I am now as forgotten as any drummer boy in the Peninsular War. March the 26th, 1940, Ramsgate. Two officers, brothers, one of them, at least, proud as a peacock. One brother gets into the carriage, the other stays on the platform, swishing his swagger stick. Embarrassed, we shake hands, say goodbye, absurdly, unnaturally casual, the train moves out and I lean from the window. We both wave a hand once and then Donald turns and is lost to sight. That would have been the last time George and his brother Donald ever saw one another as Donald went missing as his Blenheim patrol was shot down over the channel in June 1941. March the 27th, 1940, London. Today I saw The Wizard of Oz three times. It is quite charming. A fairy tale, a painted fantasy. Its philosophy is escape. Yes, I suppose so. And it has these faults too. It is unreal, sentimental, ridiculously optimistic. At any rate, it is just what this soldier wants at this moment in time. Spring of the 20th century world war. 
Somewhere over the rainbow, way up high, there's a land that I heard of once in a lullaby. June the 18th, 1940, Deleuze Du. The Germans are close behind us. A tank has been seen. A parachutist has landed three miles back. We have walked for a day and a half and our rations are diminishing. Hitherto we have avoided villages and hurried over the main roads, but now we walk boldly, wearily, down the main street of Delu and to the river bank. The river Doub is a quarter of a mile wide and we are taken over by ferry. Crowds of villagers collect and tell us to hurry. The Germans are in the next village, they say. You have no time to spare. We sit down behind a hedgerow at the water's edge. The sun is shining and we are brown and fit. But we are all dusty, tired, and here the villagers of Delu bring us wine and chocolate and loaves of bread and tell us to hurry. They lend us a guide to help us on our way, but we must hurry. A German is in the village now, they say, buying provisions. Drink your wine, finish your bread and go, they say. It is the sweetest drink we have ever taken. We rise to our feet again. It has given us new life. Delu has given us new life. June the 20th, 1940, Bessencon. We were captured at nine o'clock in the morning. At one o'clock on the next day, we lay down wearily in the dew, in the arena of a stadium at Bessencon. The Germans had marched us for 16 hours with brief rests every two hours. We have covered 58 kilometres. My feet were torn and blistered and we were all weak with hunger. He later writes in March 1945, You will remember that blazing summer of 1940. For the British Army, all roads led to Lofen and it seemed an unkindness that the sun should still shine on those days of despair. June the 24th, 1940, Bessencon. These maddening French. Whenever I wake in the prison yard, I am stopped and spoken to in villainous English. I wake on the dried mud and straw. I jostle my way through the Senegalese, Poles, Belgians. Under the lime trees, the cavalry horses lie down to die. Occasionally a German can be persuaded to destroy one. More often they are helped to life by the rations of their rider. July the 14th, 1942. From an essay on William Cowper. Accurately, then, towards the closing lines of the task, he sets down on the paper what he believes to be the purpose of his life. In his search for the meaning in all this suffering, he unwittingly gives us what we may value as highly. William Cowper. He is the happy man whose life in now shows so much of that happier life to come, who, doomed to an obscure but tranquil state, is pleased with it, and were he free to choose, would make his fate his choice. These words are so poignant at this point in time, optimistic and hopeful for the future, resigned to his confinement, yet ensuring that happiness and fulfilment is being met in the present moment, at peace with existence and making the most of what he has, not what he doesn't have. Reflecting on George's legacy and the impact his story would have had on others at the time and for generations to come, I'm a little bemused as to why he chronicled his way of life as a prisoner of war in so much detail, yet didn't share it or publish it on his release. However, I suspect that this was not unusual. Speaking to friends, family, members, in fact, novelist Damien Lewis and specialist war conflict archaeologist Dr Jilly Carr, many people of this time in history remained quiet about their experiences of the war, preferring to put that period of their lives behind them, allowing others who could and were willing to speak of it publicly. A question you may be pondering, and one I repeatedly ask myself, is why as a professional television and radio playwright and published author did George never publish this particular piece of work? either in its original format or as part of a greater piece. Well, the truth is, he did, and he didn't. He used his journal as source material for a play called A Month of Sundays that was screened several times on the BBC in 1952. There are many glimpses of George's insights from his journal to be found in this play. His own thoughts are represented through the behaviour and words spoken by several characters. One character kept a diary reporting daily events and people's idiosyncrasies. George even uses his own prison number for one of the characters. The various emotions felt across the years as a prisoner are also represented. Melancholy, depression, hope, guilt, desire, fairness, equality and death. And he speaks of how trust had to be earned over time, especially when new soldiers were introduced to the camp, just in case they were planted German spies. 
George, for one of the characters, introduces a loss of his brother and a father to another of his characters whilst being held in captivity. And this was George's own reality. His brother was shot down in a Blenheim and his father died suddenly after an operation. Having not been able to attend either funeral, he honours both of their deaths in this play. What is also evident in the play are the different perspectives that prisoners held. George explored these in detail. He did, after all, have five years in close quarters with other soldiers to study all of their habits. And the play centres on the perils involved in attempting to escape the camp. It revolves around the need to get a parcel which contains a crucial part needed to fix their canary, or their wireless, which they had hidden, and just how desperately hungry they were at the time. The title itself, A Month of Sundays, Not a Chance or a Happening, is a great metaphor for the impossible opportunity to escape their situation. And there was another outlet for George to express artistically his experiences as a prisoner of war. He appeared alongside other soldiers in the film The Captive Heart, made just a year after the, the release from Prisoner of War Camp in 1946. He has a few speaking lines, but he's not a main character, although it is my understanding that George was instrumental to the integrity of the film's accuracy of life in prisoner of war camps, having literally just come away from living in four of them across five years. So I wonder if that was enough acknowledgement for him to move on, park his scrapbook and its contents. Yet he did still keep the book. I wonder, did he perhaps forget it existed? I doubt it. That was not George's way. His mind was truly remarkable. Maybe it got boxed away in the loft for safekeeping. And despite several house moves, even across continents, across to Australia and back, it never saw daylight again. But then why did my grandmother carry on keeping it when so many of their other possessions from the past were not retained? Why had no one spoke about it over the years? What had been George's intention and purpose for writing it at the time? Was it for his own kind of therapy? We all know the power of journaling. Did he write it to honour the people of the, of the time and for those to understand what had happened in the future? Was it a case of survivor's guilt that he left it in the past? Did Viktor Frankl's story shared in Man's Search for Meaning humble George that he did, so he didn't feel his own journey was relevant anymore? Quite possibly, Frankl's was a truly harrowing account and was supported by his methodology of logotherapy. Or it could have simply been that George had tried to publish it and it had been rejected. He does write about the frustrations of several of his plays being rejected in his diary of 1946. And perhaps there wasn't an appetite to hear any more of the experiences of war. People had suffered enough and simply wanted to move on. Or was it that there had been so many prisoners of war that it had become more of a fact of general existence and experience that George's story was not in any way special or of interest to the reader? I cannot answer any of these questions with any degree of certainty. The mystery will remain unsolved as I can only speculate the answers to these questions. What I do know is George was one of the most well-educated, knowledgeable, progressive thinking men I've ever known in my lifetime. Had the war not broken out when it did, he would have likely have attended university. Instead, he spent these years as a prisoner of war studying barbed wire university style gaining certificates for his efforts from the University of London, using the various books that the Red Cross brought to the camps and recalling from memory literature he'd previously read. Later in life, as a mature student, George went on to be one of the first students to attend the Open University virtually and received his honorary degree in just under two years. So going back to the Victor Frankl conundrum, I have no way of knowing for certain whether George even read Man's Search for Meaning. I cannot imagine for a second that he didn't. There wasn't much that passed George by in the world of art, literature, history, politics, philosophy, psychology, culture, economics or sport. Perhaps when he read Frankel's account, George felt humbled by the difference in conditions under which they had each been held in captivity. What I do know is that both my grandfather and Frankel kept accounts of their personal experiences and how they survived these years being held prisoners. At the same time that George was documenting his life as a prisoner of war, Frankel was in a concentration camp over 600 kilometres away, experiencing very different conditions. Both held captive, yet living in very different circumstances and being treated in entirely different manners by the same captors. Same war, different barbed wire compounds. 
Victor Frankel was born on the 26th of March 1905. George Kerr was born on the 15th of April 1918. That made Frankel 34 and George only 21 when the war broke out and their lives were pretty much turned upside down. Frankel had studied at the University of Vienna where he focused on psychiatry and neurology. Having studied alongside Alfred Adler in what was then the emerging field of psychoanalysis, Frankel completed his training in 1930 to become a doctor, establishing his own private practice as a neurologist and psychiatrist. Before the outbreak of World War II, Frankel's publications had focused on suicide, depression and the psychological effects of unemployment. The Unconscious God, published in 1937, explored the intersection of religion and psychology, drawing on Frankel's experiences working with his patients, and emphasised the importance of finding meaning in life as a way of addressing psychological and existential crises. In 1937, George would have been finishing up at Merchant Taylor's School in Crosby. As far as my family can recall, he had not commenced attendance at university and despite being a creative young man, George instead established himself training as an accountant to please his father with the pursuit of a more acceptable profession. He clearly was yet to find his own path in the world. George went into captivity with nothing other than a mind full of literature as his foundation, whereas Frankel had his science education to rely upon. However, both George and Frankel documented their search for meaning of life whilst living in a forced, unnatural and hostile environment. In George's notes from the 25th of March 1945, he details what it was like in the enemy's camp and along his life of captivity. Free height and brot. If the slogan of the Volkischer Beobachter meant anything, it meant that the people had so much bread that with any luck they would not notice their lack of freedom. This subtlety was lost on us for our ration was inadequate and we could hardly fail to notice the shades of our prison house. And so freedom and bread were spurs for us, as for the party genossa. Freehat and Brot were the two great factors that determined the course of our day. Our prison existence was a long struggle for both. But whereas we became reconciled to the loss of freedom, we could never in all that term effect a compromise with hunger. We were undernourished throughout and we could not put the thought aside. Food became an obsession with us, the one thing in those cynical days that we never doubted or debunked. I wonder if after publication of Man's Search for Meaning, George compared his purpose focused experiences to Frankel's. If he did, George never spoke of it. In fact, he spoke very little of his time in the prisoner of war camp, other than to share a couple of stories with me about being captured, about writing his plays, learning to play the flute and acting as Horatio in the production of Hamlet in 1941 alongside RSC actor Michael Goodliffe. August 1941. The speaking of Shakespeare's words in public gives a very full sense of pleasure. One glories in the victory Shakespeare has had. One is drawn with the words almost level with him. One smiles in sympathy with those poor mortals, the audience, with the actors, with oneself. But there is this unconscious effort, too, to help the world to an understanding of what is being said and felt. Packed houses for Hamlet, requests for extra performances. The whole production is a triumph for Michael's honesty and simplicity and talent. From the reading room window, one can see all the plain laid out beneath the evening mist which drags from the river, curling lazily. There is an interval in the play and lute and recorder are playing green sleeves. The sadness of a vanished period. The exultation of the present unite to make us remember the world war and its relative position. Is it important? Is Hamlet important? Are we escaping from something here? Or are those who are fighting escaping? How remote the war is. After release, George very much left that chapter of his life behind him and instead focused on moving forward. He always held such a positive spin on life, stating that the future would be lovely and that the world would achieve sanity. George was a stoic, a pacifist, a humanist, an atheist, a philosopher, a vegetarian, a realist and an existentialist. Together we discussed existentialism, particularly in relation to Albert Camus' work Le Changer, as I studied it for my French A-level. The more I reflect on it, George understood how to live with purpose right up to the day he died as he continued to write with passion daily. He played brilliant competitive rounds of golf and always made full use of his time on earth, ensuring that every moment of his time was time well spent. This was time spent with family, with friends and his fellow old goats, as he called them on the golf course. 
Just like Frankel, George believed that each individual forms their own meaning of life, that the question of their why is one that is to be found within themselves. Life experiences, conditions, circumstances, the relationships all come together to shape our thoughts, beliefs and values. Frankel believed that life tests us and that we have the choice in how we respond. This is Reflection with Action. I choose to help people to build their life of purpose, to create it. The purpose we each choose is our individual responsibility. Purpose is an intrinsic motivation. George's scrapbook has inspired the next chapter of my journey. He wrote on the 25th of March, 1945, Such was the past which these places could remember, a past of which little evidence was left in the valley along the plain. Now, and for five years, the Kriegsgefangenenlager was to stand there, a building we were to regard as our home. Doubtless it too would contribute to something to history, but a later chronicler must speak of this. Doubtless by then the camps would have disappeared, but the rivers would be running yet, and the blizzard blowing at Dossel. Let us go in then, out of the blizzard, Let us look at some of these prison camps. Here I am, that future chronicler, 78 years on, and I will be sharing more of George's experiences in the book. I am alive today, the granddaughter of a fairly unheroic soldier, his words, not mine, yet in my eyes, he was a hero. And if he had died in World War II, he might have been deemed a hero, but I would not be here to tell his story. His story, my story, the story of purpose. For me... George's commonplace scrapbook proves that you don't find your purpose, you create it. That it is up to you as an individual to build your purpose, to spend your life creating purposeful moments, regardless of the circumstances you find yourself in. I will never know why George didn't share his diary while he was alive. However, I do believe that I was meant to find it, that I found it at a time that was right when I would understand its purpose. My book writing continues with the help of my grandfather's scrapbook and together it will become our combined legacy for generations to come who are to create their own lives with purpose. How has this conversation had an impact on you? What value have you received from tuning in? What are your reflections with actions? Please take a moment to leave me an Apple podcast or Spotify review sharing how Focus on Why has made a difference to you today. Remember, the conversation doesn't end here. To keep it going, simply connect with me on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook or Twitter or join the Focus on Why Facebook group. All the links are in the show notes. Have a purpose, have a plan, focus on why.